So I'm just going to slowly start by saying hello and good morning. Um, so this is Marie Gutbub and my name is Patricia Loy. We are both co-directing the Prototype Fund, which is a funding program for open source software and public interest tech. And we are very, very happy to be here. It's like amazing to be at an actual conference with actual people. So we're super excited. And I think it's like the highlight of the year so far for us. So I don't know if a lot of you are maybe open source developers yourself or not. But anyway, I would like to invite you to join me in the following scenario. So here goes. Imagine. You are an open source developer, and you get to develop like a really, really cool project, like something that you care about, something that you're like super passionate about, and then you get funding like for a certain period of time, say maybe six months, you have the chance to really work on your project full time, and you have the resources, you have the time, and you get to the stage where you develop a prototype fund, and you already notice that people are interested, and you get questions about it, and you feel like this could really be something big for you and for your project. And then, boom, the funding is over, and you go back to your day job. You have no more time, you have no more resources, really, to work on your project. But at the same time, people are coming at you with questions, and maybe there are like open pull requests on GitHub, and there are open issues, and you have like a full email inbox with questions about your project, but simply just not the time to react to that. So in this situation, you might think that you want to get long-term funding. Because, I mean, why not? It's a great idea to get long-term funding. But actually, the chances that you get this long-term funding are super, super, super small. And um, now you might ask, why are these chances so small? Well, it's because most funding programs are set up in a certain way. So for example, they might have a very narrow scope. As I said, Marie and I, we are co-directing the Prototype Fund, which Marie will tell you more about later on. And so at the Prototype Fund, we focus on innovation. So we don't do long-term funding. Then there's other programs that, for example, work on one specific topic. Like for the last few years, machine learning and arti artificial intelligence, for example, have been all the rage. And then there's um, also the case, which happens very often, that funding programs focus on like one specific target group. For example, academia, institutions, museums, companies, you name it. Also, what's another problem is that long-term funding for technology is not really in the books yet for, say, public funders like ministries. Um, you might say that technology is still like a relatively modern topic, so there's like a lot of development, things are happening fast, and in general, like everything is just going so, so fast. And this is not optimal for public funders like ministries because there, in general, the processes are not super fast, so they're like all a bit slower. And um, this is problematic when handling a topic which is like developing so fast. And um, also, and we see that just now. Each political cycle has its own agenda. There's new people in the ministries that work, want to work on the topics that they are interested in, and those are not necessarily the same like the topics the people before worked on. Yeah, so you have like this situation where a bunch of the projects we know, they're uh, navigating this funding scene because they're the successful ones. And we don't think it's a bad model. It just works in these very specific cases. And maybe you were in tech already uh, around Snowden times. And then everyone went like, oh my god, we need to fund crypto. We need to fund privacy software. And all these uh, privacy projects, messengers, all that stuff that was born out of po the post-Snowden era, when the next topic came, which was more AI, which was more uh, sustainability, the funds, they pivoted to other models, and these projects were partially left without funding or had to find other models. Um, one of um, the other ways you can survive in public funding is if your topic is maybe not very relevant, but you're very, very large established project. Um, the best example for these to uh, both these things is the Tor project. The Tor project had a lot of attention post known, but also it's so huge, it'll always find funding because if the Tor project starts yelling, we are, have a problem, we don't have funding anymore, immediately someone will jump in to save the Tor project, uh, be it government, academia, um, or like any um, private funders. 
Um, but even then, it can be problematic. We have seen a lot of um, projects relying on military funding in the last years or on government funding where um, the governments can just suddenly say we're not funding this anymore. Maybe you know of OTF that suddenly couldn't fund its projects anymore. We even had some uh, ring our bell and ask for funding with us even if we're tiny. Um, and also for small projects, it's much more harder to convince funders because like if you're the top project, you say, hi, I want money. People usually go like, yeah, you get money. But if you say I'm this very new cutting edge messenger and I have these features, people will say, well, but how will you beat Signal to the market? And um, how, why should I fund you and not one of the 65 other uh, messengers that are uh, asking me for money? Um, and we as Prototype Fund, we're not pretending we can solve this. We cannot solve this, not only because, as Patricia said, we do innovation, but also because funds are too small for the amount of projects we need, for the amount of technology, of infra infrastructure we need. Um, maybe this is the occasion for us to still present Prototype Fund. We're not here to adver advertise for the Prototype Fund, but it's the context of this talk. It's uh, where we learn from. Um, so I brought a few, a few key facts. So. Um, the first thing is, mm -hmm. um, so um, our name is the Prototype Fund, as we said. We're part of the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, Germany. Um, it's uh, a, um, an association that has uh, various projects in um, transparency, open data, open source, that kind of stuff. And we're part of the um, worldwide network uh, of Open Knowledge Foundations. Um, and we are funded by the Ministry for um, Education and Research in Germany here. That's where all our money comes from. We're technically a research project by the Ministry. Um, what we fund, we call it public interest tech. Um, basically, we want people who build software to do it for the public do good, to build sustainable, accessible and adaptable free and open source software that benefits the society. Concretely, we fund uh, for a period of six months each project and uh, they get up to uh, 40 um, 7,500 euro um, if they worked full-time for six months. That's one person's salary full-time for uh, six months. Um, we do up to 25 projects per round and we're currently, uh, we just started round 11. Um, in total, we funded 272 projects for a total of 11.4 million euro and we'll do this until round uh, 16 of Prototype Fund. We fund in uh, four areas, uh, that's civic tech, that's tools to empower citizens, security, self-explaining, data literacy um, to improve uh, the competence to understand and use available data, and uh, more generally software infrastructure innovation. Um, projects we fund don't only get money, they get coachings, they got support from the Team Prototype Fund. We're like quite hands-on as a fund. We um, support projects, we check in with them a lot. Uh, they have a community of other projects that are or have been funded and we try to help them network with potential partners. Um, and because we've been funding um, projects for a while, now we've been able to learn um, quite a lot about how projects can be sustainable and what models can work and that's why we just um, brought a few examples to um, uh, show you um, what works and what doesn't. Um, because there is this idea that uh, we can expect people um, to maintain their projects after funding just because they care and that should be enough. And that's like a very problematic idea of the open source developer who does it in their free times. Um, it's problematic because people should be paid. That's just a very basic idea. Um, also because it's not okay to rely on um, volunteers for critical infrastructure. If someone is has first to earn money to eat and pay their rent and then can take off our pr critical infrastructure, we have a problem because that infrastructure is, as said, critical. And we've had like Log4j and all that stuff happen in the last months. Um, I don't think I have to explain this. Um, it's also not possible for all projects, as said, to get funding. And then you have like these projects that are kind of shown as this is the proof it works, like so many Debian volunteers doing it on their free time, but they also have a huge support network. They're part of a huge community. If someone gives up, there is always, always someone to take over. They have support networks. They are like have conferences. They have travel expenses, that kind of stuff. And it's not the same for a small project. If I just built a project, then I don't have the support network. And how long are, am I going to power through um, just fighting on my own? And projects generate costs. Like, 
it's never a volunteer project. You always have server costs. You always need external help at some point, be it a designer or some expert help. You need to travel to events to connect with the community. Um, your life can change. You can have kids and suddenly your expenses change. Um, that's why we um, find like it's very important to bring um, other examples. Um, we don't want to totally dismiss um, the models where you don't earn money, so we're starting with those, and we're like increasingly going to more and more money-based models, um, because this sometimes works. Also, um, these volunteer networks always try to find funding sometimes, and that can also work. Our point is not that this is not good, it's just it's not good for everyone. And the first project we brought, um, this we funded quite a long time ago, uh, Debian Reproducible Builds. The idea is that you, as a user, then can be sure that the software you build on your computer is the actual software you wanted to build on your computer. This is the typical example that I just described. It's part of the Debian community. They have support networks. Um, they've also been very successful at applying for funding because they come with, hi, we're doing this for Debian, and we're Debian-connected people. So um, this is the perfect example for this. Another one that we uh, funded very recently is Mastodon. It's less established, it's very young, but it's been so successful, and that's like more one project that suddenly uh, got a lot of attention and a lot of money. And they've also gotten money from the community in form of donations. They've also gotten money from uh, companies. Um, they're like, just money is raining on that kind of projects when they get media attention. Um, and that's like one of the exceptions where it works. Um, the third project we brought is Chatmosphere, and this one is not known. Um, and they're like the ones that are actually going through that struggle of trying to establish a money flow without having a company, without having an organization. What they basically do is that 2D meetings, like you have these circles, and if you move, you, don't, you hear the people less, a bit like that Mozilla Spaces, if you know that. Um, it's Jitsi-based, and they had um, the issue that people liked it so much in Corona, that they were like, can I donate money for you? And then they didn't have the structures. Um, and so they had to build a non-business model structure to get a bit of the donation and maybe pay themselves a bit, but still be kind of volunteers. That totally in-between model that we hope they can build up on to then professionalize, because this is not a long-term setup. Um, and for this, uh, fiscal hosts are very interesting. Stuff like open collectives or uh, the CCT in Germany. Um, and they are actually like just setting up an open collective and going through that experience, um, a way to be a bit organized. We've like uh, prepared a little slider on the top, and like as we move, we're like going more and more to businesses. This is like a bit more organization than maybe Mastodon, but still like very um, community based. Yeah, so I'm going to take over from here again. So we stay in the area of the organized volunteer work, but we. I would say, like, give it a bit more structure than those, uh, like, rather loose technology co communities. And so I want to talk about associations, or in Germany, you have the Verein. So that's, like, a big thing in Germany. And um, because of that, if you are a German developer or you have your project in Germany, it's a really, really good idea to think about joining or partnering up with an association because they're, like, so, so many in Germany. They get funding, they have like a very strong organizational structure. And so a few of the projects that we have funded in the last years, they decided to join existing associations. So one of them is the one that you see here. It's a project called Fairtronics. And Fairtronics is a really cool tool that um, helps you in analyzing the sustainability and also the social risk in electronics products. So what does this mean exactly? For example, it helps you to detect human rights violations along the supply chain of electronics products, which is pretty cool. And they teamed up with an association which is called Verlötet, and Verlötet promotes fair electronics. So as you see, it's quite a natural fit. And they work together to inform small manufacturers about the possibilities of funding more sustainably. And um, the association, Verlötet, they provide like all the structure, the organization, etc. And the project Fairtronics, well, they provide the tech tool for that. Another project that we funded is something similar. The project is called Growing Futures. You can see it there. And Growing Futures is a tool that allows farmers that participate in Solidarische Landwirtschaft, which roughly translates to community-supported agriculture in English, 
to simply plan better throughout the year because it's like a whole um, organizational struggle to go through that when you're a farm participating in Solidarische Landwirtschaft to really like plan when you are going to plant what and then who is going to buy what and when. And this tool helps them do that. And then the Solidarische Landwirtschaft, I think like technically it's not an association in the traditional sense, but it's like this amazingly strong community and network. They have like a whole lot of structures throughout the whole of Germany. And um, what they do need is technical infrastructure, of course. So Growing Futures does provide that. So I do not want to say that joining an association is a good idea for a lot of tech product, a, a lot of tech projects. Um, but sometimes, as you can see, it can be a great fit. And the advantages of it are definitely that it helps the projects to get organizational infrastructure and it increases their reach by a lot. So from this organized volunteer work, you can even step it up a bit and um, you can found your very own NGO or your very own nonprofit organization, which could be based on your software, for example. And um, yeah within our funded projects, within our pool of funded projects, we actually found one example that did this very thing. And this is the organization Mnemonic. And Mnemonic came out of the Syrian archive. I don't know if you have heard of the Syrian archive, but it's a really cool platform that enables you to collect and archive visual evidence on social media. So what does this mean exactly? They founded um, the Syrian archive for the war in Syria. And for example, it helps you to verify videos of bombings that you find on Facebook. Because as we know now, in a lot of conflicts, there's like a whole lot of disinformation and the Syrian archives helped tackle that. And then later on, they also did the same thing for the wars in Sudan and Yemen with the Yemeni and Sudanese archives. And then in 2017, Mnemonic was founded, partly by the same team that works for the Syrian, Sudanese, and Yemeni archive. And Mnemonic provides these tools that enable human rights defenders to use digital information in order to fight for justice. So what they did was they adapted the Syrian archives workflows and simply sort of translated them for other locations. And now you might wonder, like, especially for example, in um, in comparison to having this organized volunteer work, what are actually the advantages of having your own NGO or your own nonprofit? Well, simply said, there's like a much, much broader base for funding for NGOs. So, I mean, if you have like your software project, there might be like one funder or maybe two funders for, um, for who this is interesting, what you do. But if you have an NGO that works for a certain cause, there's probably like a really big base. And this allows you to do more long-term planning and it allows you to become a lot more independent, which is of course an advantage. And then we come to businesses. Um, you think um, that we think founding a business, but actually there's many other ways to do this. And the first project we brought is Taxpin. Um, they're actually just uh, launching these days. Um, it's basically a tool that helps you put on your server um, a chat platform uh, powered by uh, Zulip, uh, Nextcloud, a password manager also by Nextcloud, I believe, only Office. Um, and there's a few other um, things that they put in. Um, and it will still grow and it like helps you manage a whole bunch of cool tools that a community could need to organize or a small company need, could need to organize um, and manage them all at once. Um, and what they did um, is that they went to a company called Greenhost that is very well aligned with what we think public interest tech is because they're not a kind of dirty hoster, they're like ethical hoster that helps communities exactly what they wanted to do with this. And now they're rolling this out together with the company. The software is still open source. Any other company can offer Stackspin. Any person can run Stackspin on their own server, but they're selling it with the company. And that means that for now, the project is sustainable because the customers will pay for the further de development of um, the tool. They're still um, independent, um, but they are safe in, some, in a financial way. 
Um, another one that is like uh, always my favorite example, um, these uh, two guys came to us and they wanted to do um, Nextcloud Collectives. It's an app that helps um, organize knowledge bases on Nextcloud. They come from a very left house project background. That was the initial idea of it. And um, they didn't know anyone at Nextcloud. They just had this idea, okay, Nextcloud is this cool platform and we can build apps on it and this is perfect for us because we're Nextcloud users. And we turned out to have contacts with Nextcloud and on the first week of their funding, we introduced them. And they realized that um, part of what they wanted to do, Nextcloud was already building. So they teamed up with Nextcloud, split the work, uh, changed their plans a little bit because you don't want to invent the same wheel twice. And um, Nextcloud liked it so much because they saw the collective aspect, but also that a knowledge base can also be some business feature you can also sell. Um, and what happened after um, two rounds of funding actually with us um, is that Nextcloud hired the guys who do this, put it as part of the Nextcloud official apps, and these guys have a safe job um, working on collectives, but also other things for Nextcloud. So this is also a benefit for Nextcloud because they got two engineers that understand the product really well. Um, and their app has been uh, um, put in a safe place as it's now an official Nextcloud app. Um, you don't always need to fund your own company, found your own company, build your own thing. Um, the open source spirit is this, is you find existing stuff, you build on top, you work together with them. And they did a very nice way of getting this very left activity app, um, very safe on a business way. Um, and um, they're like, still working on it. And that's perfect for us because we don't want to fund them a third time. We actually can't fund them a third time because we do innovation. We can't do maintenance. Um, and now we're like with um, real businesses. Yeah, exactly. So um, as Marie said, like when we talk businesses, we don't mean that you have to start your own business, but of course you can. So um, we know that a lot of times open source developers are not too much into the idea of starting their own business and like having a real business model and everything because of their ethics as open source, fun, uh, as open source developers. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and oftentimes there's also this very common misconception that there actually isn't even money to be made with open source software. But um, it's not true because there is, and there's like a variety of ways to earn money with open source software. For example, when um, offering your software as a service or when employing a subscription model for your business clients. And um, again, in our pool of funded projects from the last 10 rounds, we found a few projects that did actually start their own business. And one of them is Pretix. And maybe you have heard of them, maybe you haven't, but I'm sure most of you have used them because for this very conference, the FOSS backstage, uh, Pretix was actually the ticketing operator that you used to buy your tickets. So obviously, Pretix is an open source ticket store that can be self-installed on any web server, which is pretty cool because it leaves the control of the data entirely with the organizers and not with some weird third party that you don't know anything about. Um, they offer the software as a service and they also host ticket shops on their own servers and they are widely successful with that. Not only in the sphere of open source conferences, but um, also in a much broader sense. So, um, yeah, Pretext is one example and then the next one would be Open Sanctions. Open Sanctions is a project that we funded only very recently. And this is a project that collects profiles on individuals and also companies that are the targets of international sanctions. So you might understand why this is maybe an interesting topic at the moment. And um, it's mostly directed at journalists and activists. And while also in the future it will remain free to use for these journalists and activists, the developer is planning to employ commercial licensing models for other clients, like business clients. And then the third and last example in this section that I want to give is Fix My Berlin. So as you can see here, Fix My Berlin is map-based and it's a platform that initially presented data on the bicycle infrastructure in Berlin. So for example, a tab you see where the construction of a new bike lane was planned and um, how the progress was uh, with, with those bike lanes. And they used their software 
as a foundation, and now they systematically use OpenStreetMap to improve the data situation for municipalities all over Germany. So I just want to say that we don't want to imply that you have to like receive millions in venture capital to be successful with your open source project. But we feel like whatever makes a project sustainable without wearing you as developers out is actually a success. Yeah, and uh, we also know there's a lot of other models, like every project is um, has that its own specificity. We've also seen people reach out to academia, either because a project could be um, useful in a research field and therefore um, paid for by universities, or because some tools we've also seen are useful for teaching, um, and that they use as a teaching tools, like um, platforms to share slides, that kind of stuff. We've also funded some of that. Um, or we've seen universities simply giving server space to projects or um, students that spend a few months working on a project and that was a way to support. Um, there is models in museums, there is models in partnerships with NGOs. Um, there are so many specific small models, those are just the general ones that um, could apply to quite a lot of projects. Yeah, and so for the roundup, like I want to say again that we, as a prototype fund, of course, we are funders. So we think that funding is important and funding is great and it can be a great start for a lot of projects. But we just want to stress that we think it's equally important for developers to know that funding simply isn't the only solution. We showed you a variety of alternatives and we know that not all of them are like the right fit for every software project. But it's really worth it to taking this option into consideration when thinking about how to make your open source project sustainable. Yeah, and one thing uh, we don't want to forget is money and whether you get some or not is not the only criteria for sustainability. Um, this is something we can't go uh, into in this talk, but um, just a few learnings that we constantly make is um, whatever model you have plan in advance. Like if you go to the six month of funding and then go like, oh shit, what do I do next? This won't work because you will lose interest before you find a solution. You have to start thinking the day you get funding, that's where you think, what do I do after funding? Do I apply for further funding or do I s start building something? Um, also take time to communicate about your project. We see such great projects that have no website or a very bad website or just a GitHub. Um, if that may be okay for an infrastructure page um, that is only uh, targeting devs but, um, or admins, but not if you have a user-facing uh, product. Um, build diverse teams. Diversity is strength. Like these teams with like three white dudes with the same background, the same tech knowledge, um, and always end up running into like blind spots, into um, a lack of skills in some areas that are um, different from theirs. Um, take care of your community. We've also have quite a lot of projects that say, I don't need a community, I'm going to do business. Even if you do business in open source, you will need a community. You, oh, that's what open source lives from. And you don't need always to build yours. You can also join an existing community, like the Debian community, the Nextout community, all these communities that we've named. Um, it doesn't mean you need to start a new group of people for each project, but you need to be somehow part in a community. And in the same sense, um, don't reinvent the wheel, contribute. Don't rebuild every little bit that already has been built 50 times. If it exists, contribute, improve it, communicate with the people already build it. Um, you also save money in, the <laughs> in time uh, in the process. Um, and in the end, the open source community will be stronger if you work like this. Um, we won't go further into those topics, but we're here all day and we're super happy to talk about any of those later. <laughs> And on a last note, we talked a lot about like all the alternatives to funding and maybe some of you are convinced, but maybe some of you aren't. So if you aren't, you can still apply for our next funding phase, which will start in September and the deadline is open until 31st of March. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to both of you. Um, in case there are any questions from the audience, just let me know and I'll hand around the microphone so people in the live stream will hear the questions as well. Um, if there's no question for the moment, there's actually something from our online platform. Um, someone says, and I think you touched on it already, but um, want to rely on funding, securing funding for when the latest rounds uh, run out can become a full-time job. Do you help open source maintainers to find follow-up funding um, and wave ways to move forward? 
Well, we try to. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like as we said before, there isn't that broader base for long-term funding at the moment. So we try to like point the projects into different directions. So for example, we know there's um, a base for funding at the NLNet Foundation and Mozilla has some funding and then there's always the OTF. So we try and point them in this direction. And also during the funding period, we talk to the projects like a lot and we try to hear like, what are the challenges? What are the problems? Like, have they thought about the future? And then like, try and talk about, oh, you are doing this and that. Well, maybe have you thought about these people as a target group? Maybe try and contact this association or this NGO or whatever. So we try and do that. But then again, very honestly, like sustainability is like one of the biggest challenges when funding for us. And we'd love to have five fundraisers on staff and just give them for fr out for free to our projects. Yes. Um, if someone wants to fund us to have um, yes. five fundraisers, we take it, but we don't have it, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yep. Uh, first, thank you for the nice talk. Um, you talked a lot about this, doing the open sourcing first and probably then uh, starting a company. Um, and we, for example, are in the situation the other way around. We have a company, we have a product, and we now start to build the open source or the core of the product, basically extract it as an open source project to because as much in it others could could yeah, uh, use. And uh, this is something uh, we see, uh, we think it's quite different because the prototype fund, uh, for example, is, is targeted at, at individuals, right? So uh, non-company related or employed people. Do you know any product? Or is this probably also an idea to, to have, especially small companies, um, to to yeah go, go this way the other round from from like uh, working business to an open source community i think it's funny how mostly when we talk about the prototype fund all questions all the questions we get are, about are on our dream list <laughs> like we'd love to um fund small companies we'd love to do fundraising all these things um i think what we need to acknowledge is that we're never going to cover all needs. Um, and what we need is actually more funders, like a lot of small, diverse, lightweight funds, and also some for companies. It's, there is definitely a lack there. Like there is a lack from, for maintenance funds and other similar things. Um, and it's something we know we keep having questions. Can you fund my company? Right now we can fund a private person that may have been part of a company before or not. Um, but legally, we're simply not allowed to fund a company. Um, but it's definitely on the list of nice to have, um, but we're not going to cover it. OK, anything? Yep. I have a question about uh, the consequences of funding. So funding can be great b because it allows people to spend time on, on uh, developing open source software. But it can also be in some cases be harmful for a community, for example, when one person is uh, paid for uh, working in the community and others are not, and there's friction, and uh, uh, I, I guess there are a lot of other uh, possible pitfalls there. Do you have anything in, in place to, uh, in, in the way how you select projects or how you support projects to prevent that there's harm done by funding? Well, I don't think like we have this like sort of strong methodology for this case, like where we have certain recommendations that we give, but um, can maybe give like a sneak peek into the very near future <laughs> where uh, we will um, ourselves public a knowledge base, uh, publish a knowledge base, for example, where we want to cover this topic exactly. Because, um, I mean, I'm not sure what your take on this is, but I would say there's not like this one right answer on how to work in a community where some people are paid and then the rest of the people aren't. But I think there's like a lot of experiences in different communities and we try to talk to them and see what their recommendations are and then just collect it all, publish it all and hope that this is helpful for people. I feel like I don't want to reject the responsibility, but um, it's a bit problematic to tell us, to tell communities what's good for them and what's not. Like if a community tells us we need money, we can't say, well, we think this would be bad for you because <laughs> you would start fighting. I, I don't feel like it's our responsibility. We cannot start selecting on that kind of criteria. 
But education, as Patricia says, knowledge bases, that kind of stuff. But in the end, I, I would feel very uncomfortable denying funding because I think you're going to start fighting. <laughs> Okay, any, any further questions? Um, if not, as you said, you are here um, for the oh rest of the day so people um, can, can speak to you. Then in that case, thank you very much uh, for, for your talk. It was Thanks a pleasure for having, having you. Us. Thanks. <laughs>